people want to hire an A player, but they're just afraid to, or and they just never pull the trigger, or they do hire an A player, then they chop the legs out from under them and undermine them because they, the owner has to be the best, and then they end up with no A players, or they end up with a bunch of C players, and they say, ah, yeah, there's just no good help out there. Nobody wants to work these days. So, Tori, welcome back to the podcast. It's It's been a few years, but uh, we'll jump into a lot that has changed for you since then. But uh, how are you doing today? Hey, Todd. Uh, great to see you and talk to you. Doing well. You know, the sun's shining here in Houston right now. And, uh, you know, it's a good Monday to, to, to be out there trying to get work done. Right on. So you were on the podcast back in 2015. You said it was episode 15, I think. You were one of the first people I interviewed on the podcast, and we, we talked about some pretty interesting stuff, but we're not going to rehash all of that because a whole lot has changed since 2015. But just give us a quick introduction. What's your name, company name, and what kind of work do you do? And where are you located? Yeah, Tori Hawkins, uh, president and owner of Angular Construction. We're here in Houston, Texas, uh, and, and really excited to talk to you again and tell you how we, where we've come from way back then to, to where we are now. And what what type of work do you focus on? Yeah, so we're a, we're a general contractor, and really we've started specializing more in the design build opportunities. And we can go into that a little bit more later. But our primary project types are large industrial distribution, manufacturing, constru- uh, concrete tilt wall, anywhere from you know let's say a hundred thousand feet upwards of seven hundred thousand feet. Gotcha. So let's spend a few minutes talking about the circumstances under which you started your business and and when that was. Tell us, take us back to when you started the business and, and give us a, a few minutes review of what what the situation looked like back then. Well, the situation was was a little bleak, and uh, you know that was coming out of the financial crisis. I started the business in, in early 2010. Was working for another gentleman before that was a developer, and we were trying to get an internal general contracting arm underneath that business. Financial crisis happened, and really no development going on, so therefore no reason for a GC under that company. And uh, he and I decided just kind of to part ways, and uh, I took the GC arm. Uh, it's something that I had had wanted to do, you know, and in the focus times, I thought I would just be a, a commercial GC that that focuses on corporate interiors and doing uh, work for some clients that I knew. And, and that success on the interior side led us into the ground up market. And, and you know, the vision from early on in the business has totally switched to to where it is today with, you know, ground up uh, vertical construction comprising about. 80% of our revenue and and with the, you know, probably another 10 to 15 uh, focusing on the, uh, the corporate interiors. So paint the picture of what the business looks like today, ballpark revenue, number of employees, uh, markets you're in, that kind of thing. Yeah, so we'll do uh, our, our target revenue for 2023 right now will be somewhere between 200 and uh, 250 million in total revenue. Um, you know, I think we have 54, 55 employees. Um, so some of the interesting things that I've done is we've started some self perform groups within the corporation. Uh, we do our own framing, drywall, uh, ceiling installation, hanging doors, painting on any of our uh, and, and interior finish out projects. And we've also started our own. We have uh, Angler Site Work, which does dirt work, utility installation, water, sanitary, fire lines, all with it under the corporate umbrella. And that's given us a huge competitive advantage uh, when we're out there chasing projects. Um, one, for the ability to, to control the quality that we're delivering. And, and I really looked at and looked at where our weak points were in our projects and being able to deliver the quality that we wanted to the end users that we had promised during the contractor interview phase. And that's those two areas where we really found that we were, we were dropping the ball and our schedules were getting pulled, you know, were, were behind or the finishes weren't there. And I was, you know, I just kind of said, well, if they're going to mess it up, why don't we just do it ourselves and do it right? You know, 
and uh, it's 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 been great to the company. So a lot of general contractors would well, in my experience, GCs are typically like on one end of the extreme or the other. They're either construction management; they don't self perform anything or very little. Frankly, most of the CMs and GCs that I worked with were like that. Or there's like we self perform everything. I'm curious, what was the the process once you decided, hey, we need to do this. Like we we need to create a, a site work. We need to do our own site work, for example. What was the 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 process for figuring that out? Was it did you do a lot of analysis on the front end and then make the decision? Or was did you make the decision and then figure out how to how to make it work? Or was there a different fundamental approach? You know, I think it was just more of a circumstance in a situation, and I call it kind of a blessing, um, and met an individual who came referred to me from from a, a client of ours who, who had worked at a large uh, plumbing and site work contractor, and that company got bought out and wanted to go do something else. So first we started about, we brought him in on the pre-construction side to help us with bid analysis, pricing, schedules, and you know, and then the more we talked and the more we talked, he's like, well, I can do this. I can do this. And so then we really looked at it. And that's when we looked at the schedules of saying, hey, now we don't do it on all of our projects. It's got to be on a certain size range that we'll we'll do our own uh, you know, site work and utilities on. But we really looked at it and just said we're 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 trusting the success of our company into somebody who doesn't care about the success of our company. Like to me, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? And so you're getting a project up out of the ground, very, very critical path, lots going on with permitting and 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 submitting to the city of Houston for water meter applications and all kinds of things that, you know, a lot of times we were we were already but kind of behind the eight ball before we'd even gotten a project out of the ground. And, that, and that's when I really said, let's control our own destiny. Let's let's deliver what we're supposed to and and be successful from you know, from the beginning, so we don't have to try to play catch up so much uh, at the end of a project. Yeah. So, you know, the analysis was kind of all in my noggin and just knowing that this is something we needed to do. Would you say that move was triggered by this guy who came along and presented an opportunity or were you actively looking for a way to, to create your own site work division? Uh, no, I mean, it really came about the opportunity of meeting him and somebody who had the success and the experience to be able to deliver it for us. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So let's talk about once you made the decision, you're going to do your own site work. You know, yellow, all that yellow iron is pretty expensive and requires a it lot is. of maintenance and mechanics and trucks and all this sort of stuff. Can you describe in general how that process went of? creating that uh, self-performed division? Was it sort of a plan it all out from start to finish before you started? Or was it, we're going to just sprint into this and figure it out as we go? Well, as most things in construction, it was kind of a sprint into it and see how things go, right? And of course, we started it in 2019. Uh, you know, COVID comes along, work stops, you know, for new projects, definitely getting put on hold, questioning myself, what have I gotten us into? Um, you know, the old kind of business owner, entrepreneur, like, oh my God, knucklehead, what did you do type of deal, right? But but it really allowed us as, as everything started coming back in the construction industry to be more successful. And I just kind of had the faith that this is something that would separate our company from from our competitors. And it was something that we needed to continue to pursue. Uh, also in 2019, we, we bought our own building. So we had a place to you know store equipment, uh, any of the material that we needed, those types of things, uh, which really helped it, you know, continue to be successful. But it, it was a quite challenging time through 2020 and early into 2021. Yeah. So speaking of challenges, you've grown the business to $200 million a year, uh, 200 to 250, I think is what you project for this year, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What were some of the biggest challenges that you faced during that growth over the past, well, since we spoke last, the last eight years? The biggest challenge is, you know, in, in our business, anybody can do work, right? 
you can typically go find construction projects. You can go do those things. Now, you know, the construction industry is the only one that, that I know of from a industry. You don't know if you're making any money till you're done, right? Like, you know, if you're, if you're selling widgets, you know what your cost of goods is, you know what your margin is, you sold that widget, you've made your money, right? Ours is like, okay, we got a project and we need all these things to happen and mother nature's got to be nice to us and we hope we have good owners and they're going to pay us. And, you know, the, the win is at the end of the project, not when, not when you, you know, just sign up a contract. So it really took me the challenges of one, finding the right people. People make this business successful. It's not, you know, I, I, I do not think it's me at all. It's, it's totally my team that's here and the ability to understand the data uh, you know, and, and use technology to to have a current view on where we stand on these projects. You know, do we have one that's a problem jumping on it soon, you know, instead of letting it drag out and trying to have it be a problem later and really looking, you know, people and data, people and data is the two things that that continue to allow us to be successful and have, giving everybody that visibility into their projects to know how they're doing at, at any moment in time. What are some of the the tools that you're using for for data. Yep. So we we were one of the we've been on Procore for a long time, and it's it's got its blessings and its curses and and everything else. But the next step was to go from Procore to really get involved in the data that's in Procore. So we we spent last year working with them. We have Procore Analytics that goes to Power BI. So we can see we have a number of different reports that come out on all of our projects on a daily basis. I can look at every project, you know, where are we on our on our profit, our contingency, where are we in correlation between our general conditions and our overall project completion uh, percentage and, and know, oh, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm under, okay, good, or no, hey, we're burning more out there than we have in the job. We need to, we got to pick the schedule up or we're going to have to figure out where we're going to have to cover those additional costs. And now we're starting to work with another company too, um, uh, uh, Brick Software, to do some more analytics of the data and the forecasting model looking forward to make sure we don't have a revenue gap in say, you know, June or July, 2023, all the stuff that was kind of in my head and our controller's head and the PM's head, we're getting onto a screen so we can see it, we can make decisions about it. We can then decide, hey, you know, we don't need to pursue as much work right now because look at our backlog, right? Or we want to work with the right clients and, and, or, hey, we need to get a little more aggressive to make sure we have something starting in, you know, October this year, right? Because our project life cycles are so long especially on the design build side that you spend so much time early on in the pre-construction phases before you even really kind of start making any, any, you know, re revenue or profit on them. So we're, we're always trying to look 12 to, you know, 18 months ahead to see what, what the future holds for us. Now, some people would say, Tori, yeah, but man, everything's out of my control. I can't control the weather. I can't control the permitting, I can't control the customer making decisions. I can't control the general contractor. I can't control the trades in front of me. So why bother doing all that forecasting? What would you say to them? You know what I really learned, and I think the 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 overall global pandemic. And I mean, we went in 2020. We were on a, a huge revenue growth going into that again, and we had half of our revenue gone in a couple days right or let's say in a month projects getting stopped these types of things going on right you know i i didn't know my numbers as well then and i really learned during that time we need to be looking out ahead we knew how we did on the projects but we didn't know where are things where are we going right and if you don't know where you're going how are you going to be successful and all of those things you said that's just life in construction you know, and we, we have we have a comment sometimes you just got to, you know, put on your boots and dig in and, 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 and figure it out. And you can't use those roadblocks as, you know, as something that's going to hold you back because this is what we get paid to do. And this is what we signed up for. Yeah. Yeah. So there are some challenges you faced as a company to get where you, you want to be. I'm curious, were there any challenges that you faced as the, the CEO of the business that has grown so much? Like, were there any cert certain points where you found that you had to change or you had to, 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 to level up? Oh, yes. Yeah. And really, I learned over the past two years 
not, you know, we've always had, you know, starting out, you know, we had, we started with myself for a while, then one employee, then three employees, and you, and you kind of grow. But we were getting to the point, I can't do, I can't do everything, right? And, and not that I wanted to do everything, but I felt like I had to oversee everything, right? And I don't know if that was me not having the ability to to trust the people that work for me or, so, or living in such of that negative mindset that, okay, I got to find out where things are going to go go wrong, right? And I really looked at it and said, let's put that behind. It's time to be a leader and and create kind of the, the vision for the company and find awesome people that can work here that will want to be part of the company, that want it to be successful, that take just as much pride in it as I do, and then give them the opportunity to su- succeed and help them grow and reward them and show them how much how important they are to the company so i really went from a you know kind of one of those guys that felt like he was got his hands in everything and working you know in the business and now i'm trying to be in a position where i can work on the business and i know everybody says those types of things but i felt like if this company was going to take it to this next level and continue to grow I, I got to have a leadership team. I got to have, you know, a solid controller. I got to have a great VP of construction operations. I got to have all of these people in the right seat and and let them go do it, you know, and check in with them and make sure they're happy and help them if they need it. But, you know, stay out of the way sometimes. That's a tough one. That's a really tough leap for a lot of people. And frankly, I think it keeps people stuck because they can't, they can't let go or right. they they can't i've seen all sorts of varieties of this where people want to hire an a player but they're just afraid to or and they just never pull the trigger or they do hire an a player but then they chop the legs out from under them and undermine them because they the owner has to be the best and then they end up with no a players or they end up with a bunch of c players and they say, ah, yeah, there's just no good help out there. Nobody wants to work these days. So it seems to me that that ability to let go of things, to not be able to touch, a big jump seems to be when people go from touching every part of the process to handing off part of the process to somebody else. And they have to, there has to be somebody else between them and the customer or somebody else between them and and the subcontractors. So I want to talk about some of those systems and processes in a minute, but you've grown the team dramatically. I'm sure you've got some high quality people there. How how do you think about finding and recruiting and hiring top quality talent? Like how is it a let's wait until we need somebody approach? Is it I'm constantly recruiting? I'm like a college basketball coach. Is it like, how do you think about growing your team with high quality people? You're constantly recruiting. And sometimes, you know, you're right. And sometimes you're wrong in your recruitment process. And, and that's the challenge of being the business owner. We are very, very slow to hire. And when we start talking to people, we talk and we meet with them. And then we talk again. And, and, and we, tr- you know, I, I've learned when, when you need somebody ASAP, you'll usually make a wrong mistake because you're just trying to fill a seat on the bus, right? And getting kind of even a, a, a Rolodex of people that you know you can call on when the time's right and you talk to them you know consistently and say hey man i really want to bring you on but we're waiting on this project we're waiting on this hang with us do those types of things that most people if they want to come to your or my organization they'll hold on and wait for the opportunity because they know that then the business owner is making a right decision and not just trying to throw bodies at at workload or a problem or, or whatever the situation is but it's you know we, we do a lot word of mouth. I think we have a good reputation in our industry here in Houston, from the subs to suppliers to clients, owners, architects, that we do get some inbound, you know, type A, um, you know, all stars that have that have come to us. And part of it's just luck. I mean, really, it is you meet somebody and you talk to them, and they turn out to be a great person. And you coach them up and you give them the opportunity to succeed. And, and they did. You know, yeah. So let's talk about um, systems and processes. This is something that we live and breathe around here. So 
First question is how important were systems and processes to achieving the growth that you have in the business so far? Well, I, I don't think we wouldn't be where we were without without those. And and I know from my situation, I'm not the best at them, right? Like I want to go find opportunities and tee them up and let my guys go execute. So really, you know, the leadership team of the division heads, VP of construction operations and our controller really work together gather on, okay, here's how the process works. Here's, you know, the bid estimate comes in. How does it get assigned out? How does it go on the bid calendar? All of those things from the first call or email all the way through project completion. Are we perfect? No, we're not. I'm not going to sit here and say that we are, right? But but it's come a very, very long way and in getting those, you know, from you know, okay, who else is looking at the estimate before it goes out? So it's not, you know, one person isn't all on their, it may be on their shoulders to do the estimate, but then we have a peer review before it gets sent out. And we analyze the subs that we're looking at and those types of things before it gets sent in as a, as a proposal to, you know, our controller doing, you know, job cost reviews on a, on a really on a monthly basis with the PMs, looking at the budget, where are areas of concerns, maybe there's extra money that they found that we can move over to contingency or cover something else that we didn't know, you know, that we, that we missed or, Hey, we just want to make the customer happy and we have a little money in the budget. Let's do it. Right. Those types of things all the way through, you know, completion. And, and, and you know, we kind of joke, uh, one of the, my VP of construction operations came up, you know, he's got a saying, you know, is it done or is it done, done, right? Like, are we done, done, hundred percent build, punch list signed off, you know, close out the project, move it into inactive, recognize the profit all the way through, not just getting the CEO or getting them into the building. It's, it's really finalizing it and, and looking at the data or, you know, so we can make a better decision on the next project. Right. Yeah. So what's um, looking back, maybe the past few years, what were some of the, the most impactful systems or processes you put in place that were critical to your growth? Anything come to mind? Um, well, I mean, I think using the technology helped a ton, right? Procore and the systems that have and outlining that and, and, and they've gone in and created, you know, task lists for each employee and what are they supposed to do in that situation of, okay, you start a new job, the job number gets assigned, then it goes to this person, then it gets uploaded into our accounting software. And then it does. So that all the way through of how that data passes through multiple people's hands and, and using as much technology as we can for that to make sure that each person is doing it the same way. Um, we brought in Procore trainers to come in and train the people so that every job gets entered the same way into the software. So the data will spit out on the back end, looking the way that that it'll need to. You know, I mean, it, it, everything, our files on the server are all set up the same way. When you start a new job, here's all the way, you know, here's how each folder in that project looks like. I mean, so it's, you know, it's, it's set up that, if something happens and life happens to people, right? Or somebody has a kid and they need to be out for a couple of weeks that another PM knows where to go get that information and can jump right in. And, and, you know, our guys also do a lot of collaboration where they know what's going on in each other's projects so they can step up and help if need to. Some people would say, man, that sounds like micromanagement. It sounds like the man telling me how to do my job, looking over my shoulder. I, I need more. I can't be boxed in like that. What would you say to those people? To me, you got to have a skill. You got to have a, a, a plan or framework for success. I'm not telling you how to do your, your pay apps, but your pay apps are going to be saved here, right? And when we start a job, here's the process we're going to go through to make sure that all of these things are getting done. Is our signage going up? Is our windscreen going up? Where's our OSHA posters? All those things and, and trying to, to, to make your life easier so you can just execute on it versus going and oh where's this and where's that and i don't know what to do here it's like we're trying to work you know we're trying to stay lean but have the framework for success so guys aren't aren't working backwards so much yeah yeah absolutely it's instead of having to remember what what am i supposed to do and how should i do this it's just it's my i had a professor in college dr wu find the right formula and just turn the crank you just work your way yep. through the list personally i'm glad that airline pilots don't take the same approach that a lot of project managers do on projects where they just kind of walk into it and you know take it take things as they come i'm really glad 
to see the pilot walking around doing the pre-flight check, all the checklists. I kind of like that rigor when my life's at stake. So I, I think it uh, I think it carries over into uh, into a lot of other things. Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, we've even we've ordered you know massive job boxes, right? And so hey, you go start a job. Everything's in that job box that you need to start the job and get your trailer set up, right? So when you say, hey, we're, we're, we're mobilizing the XYZ project, that, that job box gets loaded on a forklift, taken out by one of our, you know, one of our laborers, dropped off, all this first aid stuff's in there, OSHA's in there, fire extinguishers, hard hats, vests, blah, 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 everything's in there. And then when they're done, hey, whatever you have left, put it back in the box and bring it back, and we'll work on cleaning up that next box while another one's going out, right? And so guys can hit it with a mindset of success versus you know, oh, where's this? Where's that? I need this. I don't have that type of deal, right? And, and try to make everybody's lives a little easier. Yeah, I uh, came up with a term. I realized, man, so many problems. And I spent, I don't know, 20 years managing projects as a owner's rep, GC, trade partner. I realized so many problems come down to this: these four letters, J-E-T-S, just enough to start. We do just enough to get the job started. And that, that just sets off this domino reaction of chaos. But right. we'll do like what you're saying. Let's give them everything they need to finish the task up front mm-hmm. before they even ask. Give them everything they need. Then it just eliminates so much, so much chaos. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So let's yep. talk about your role. Um, I, Read a lot of uh, EOS books, traction, uh, rocket fuel, and in EOS terminology, there's the visionary, who's like big picture st- relationships, big ideas guy, and then there's the integrator, the person who puts all the systems in place. Which of those buckets would you fall into? No, I'm definitely the visionary. Okay. I mean, uh, even the even the team here laughs a little bit. I'm like, hey, let's go get into this and do that. And they're like, whoa, 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 hold on, time out, time out. You know, <laughs> and, and but I think that vision, you know, really, I learned. Okay, what are we good at, and what do I like to build, right? And and we really went back and said. Hey, I enjoy these design builds. I love going and meeting with another business owner who, you know. Or, Maybe they make valves or they're, you know, we have a great client now that that does uh, gener- large trailer generator rentals. And, you know, he's like, hey, I, I bought this land and I want to build a building. And we're like, okay, dude, let's sit down and dig into your operations, right? How does your product come in? How does it leave? Where, you know, where do your workers come in and look at all of those things in the project before we've even really gotten into drawings, right? And like, let's build this out so it gives you the best opportunity to make as much money as you can in your business, right? Um, and that's the stuff that that I personally really enjoyed. And, and it said, well, hey, if this is what I enjoy, let's start looking at doing more of these design build scenarios where we bring in the architects underneath of us, we bring in the engineers, we help them, we do the geotechs, we do the two topo surveys, we're doing everything on the pre-construction services for them so they can focus on running their business and we get to build a building for them, right? And we know at the end, it's going to be what they wanted because we've been talking to them up front and working our way all the way through the through the whole project life cycle. So, you know, and that that we had to turn away some other work that may have been a hard bid scenario where they've sent it out to five GCs and it's competition is going to be tight. And, and it's like, there's no fun in that. I, I don't enjoy it. I don't not, you know, it's just kind of like a vanilla type of opportunity. And I was like, why, why do something that personally doesn't get me that excited versus one of these other opportunities that I, that I enjoy and get excited about when I come to work every day. Yeah. So that visionary helps steer us to, you know, to the pro- type of projects that, that I want us to pursue that you have a good client relationship in them. You get to stay involved from early on, you get to, you get to, be involved and keep things from having to work backwards through value engineering and those types of things because the project's over budget and have those discussions early on where before, you know, I don't think if I hadn't been that visionary, we would have just been out pricing work, you know, and, and that shift over the past really 24 months has, has been, uh, it's been very successful. 
And I think the project managers and the division heads and everybody's seen the, the, you know, kind of the joy that goes along with that and seeing somebody who's excited about their building at the end. And you were with them day one and when they were looking at dirt. Yeah. So let's talk about your day to day. What are the top two or three things at the top of your list that you try to stay focused on or the things that are most important to you? Yeah. So, you know, the, the biggest one last year was, was getting the analytics up and running so we can see everything. So now I'm looking at it at a, at a much higher level, how we do and where we go. And are there any problems that I need to talk with, with the VP of construction operations about also working very closely with our controller, you know, where are we on cash flow billings? You know, do we have any problem clients that are late or, you know, those types of things, right? And then I spend a lot of time working with our marketing t uh, team on, you know, what's the message we're putting out via social media and email blasts and, and do I need to go to, to you know, something and speak on a panel and, and do those types of things to get the name out to try to be you know, leading the company forward, not as heavily involved in day-to-day in -day execution. I just saw a video from Steve Jobs from like 1997, and he talked about uh, how focus is about saying no. So I'm curious, what are some things that you are, you've started to say no to in the last 12 months that you used to say yes to? The projects were that, that the opportunities that are presented to us, you know, if, if I can't maintain the margin that I want, that I think that's going to allow us to be successful, uh, I'm not going to waste our time on estimating the project, right? I mean, there, there are GCs out there that want to play in a massive volume game and really low fees on the commercial side. And I tried to compete with them a number of years ago and they kicked my face in the dirt on multiple occasions right and so uh you know you learn from your mistakes and so getting saying no to some of those opportunities or you know as i kind of call it a soft no um you know hey man i think we're going to be around here if, if if that's not in your budget then we're probably not the right guy for you right and and if all you're worried about is how much can you get that cost down as tight as possible um, with no contingency and ability to make customers happy. I don't want to do it. You know, I mean, it's just, it's hard to have those conversations, but I would rather have those conversations early than be in some type of battle at the end, right? Battling over every nickel and dime and, and trying to change order people left and right. I mean, it's just, to me, there's better things to do with, with the company and, and, you know, our mindset and, and everything else. Yeah. Let's talk about you personally. What are some some habits or routines that are important to you? Either something you do every day, every week, every month, every year, anything come to mind? Oh, sure. I mean, there, there's, you know, daily and weekly habits, right? Um, you know, I mean, of course, construction is stressful. It, uh, you got to find a way to, to, you know, eliminate the stress, whether that's, you know, I mean, not that I'm a picture of health or anything, but I try to exercise a few days a week just to, just to take the, the stress level down. I mean, I got a great family spending time with them. I, I love the outdoors. So getting to, to go do things, you know, in the outdoors, um, I do try to take some time away over the summer to really spend some time with my family. Um, and the team here has allowed me to do that, that I don't have to be micromanaging them. I can check in, I can talk to them, you know, and, and some of those places that we, we get away to, some of our clients are there. And I've, I've picked up opportunities and projects being at some of those places because of, you know, the other business owners and those other people are doing the same thing that time of year. Right. And so, um, that's a big one to me is, is to kind of have some time away from the business to, to think and to plan and, you know, talk, think about where we are going and what I want the company to look like. I want to talk about vision in just a minute, but I want to go back to a phrase you shared before, just before we hit record, which was something to the effect of we are, your team says we're clubbing black swans like on a daily basis. Can, uh, <laughs> can you explain, explain what that means? Yeah, I mean, that was one I came up with, well, you know, and I think it was probably May or June 2020. 
you know, we're all, we've all talked about the pandemic and everything enough. We've beaten that one, but God, you know, we had projects stopping. We had, you know, and then you went from, you know, okay, projects are coming back and now material prices are going through the roof and now you can't get permits. And, you know, it was just kind of one of those things like what, what's the next fire that's going to happen today. Right. And, and so we kind of nicknamed it around the office, just clubbing black swans on a daily basis because it felt like, you know, all of these things that are supposed to happen maybe in your life of these random, you know, events in the financial crisis and all this other stuff were happening about every other day. And uh, you're just, you're just trying to get by and survive. And, uh, you know, so that's how we kind of came up with that around the office. In the construction industry, the default is to have more of an, an auditor or negative mentality because we're always looking for what's wrong, right? Always. Right looking for what's missing in this scope of work, what's what the owner's trying to get over on us in the contracts, what this guy's not doing, what's not happening, looking for deficiencies, right? And then on a macro scale, you start looking at, well, well shit, when's, what's going to happen next? When's the next shoe going to drop? And it can put you in a pretty negative mindset where you're just constantly waiting for bad things to happen. And maybe you only see bad things. How do you how did you keep your team moving forward with with all those black swans? And for those of you who aren't familiar, like what the hell's a black swan? It's like Chris Voss talked about. I actually there was a book called Black Swans. There are these rare events because most people think swans are all white, but there are some black swans. And a, a black swan is this event that comes out of nowhere, like COVID nineteen. Uh, the Russia invading Ukraine and all these other crazy things happening, a shipping container getting stuck in the Suez Canal or wherever that was. Those are black swan events. So when all of these black swans are attacking you guys and you're clubbing them every other day, how do you, as the leader, keep the team somewhat positive and, and focused on moving forward? I don't, for some reason, I had a comfort level internally that we were going to get through it. I mean, I had plenty of sleepless nights. I had plenty of very, very stressful days, plenty of, of, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? How, you know, how is this going to work out? Um, and, and, you know, really went to the, to the core values and just had this kind of faith that we were going to get through it. I don't, I don't know why, I don't know how, you know, and just said, hey, and tomorrow we wake up and we put on our boots and we go back to work. And we're going to keep doing that every day as long as it'll allow us to do it, right? And at some point, things will change and and it'll go, uh, it'll go the way that we want it, right? And I think the changing in the strategy, the changing in the vision helped us keep that kind of positive mentality because we started seeing rewards from it and we started getting the projects that we want. And we started working with the people. I mean, our clients before were great. We still do a lot of work for the, with some of them too, but we all got a lot happier, I felt like, because we were we were chasing projects that internally fulfill, you know, fulfill us, right? Um, and, and that's rewarding in itself. And things just kind of slowly, slowly continue to pick up speed. And we still have plenty of challenges and everything, but, um, you know, I just think I had to, I had to show that, you know, that kind of calm and collective leadership between the team and check in with everybody and make sure they're doing okay. And, hey, we'll get through this and it's going to be tough. And, you know, and it, you just kind of got to have faith in, in the whole entire process that it's going to play out. And if you think positive, usually positive things will happen. If you think negative, usually negative things will happen. I don't know if it's just how it, 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 it attracts itself, but that was, you know, it was very, very hard for me when we were dealing with a lot of challenges, but I knew I had to come into work and put on a smile and, and you know, pump guys up and, and hide the internal challenges and, to be a leader, to, to have that faith that we were going to continue to execute. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. So how do you think about sharing the, the vision for the future with your company and then getting the team on board with it? What are some, some practical ways that you share the vision? And the reason I ask is because a lot of business owners, they have their vision in their head and it's really clear. 
but their team just doesn't seem to be on board with it. Or there's this disconnect. And sometimes the team even gets frustrated when people, when the business owner talks about their vision. So how do you go about articulating your vision for the company and getting your team on board with it? Yeah, so we, we, you know, I, I, and I'm not perfect at it. I'm sure we have challenges and everything else, but I really started doing a lot more and a lot better communication, right? Internally. And, and that's, you know, from our weekly ops meetings to a company wide staff meeting to, and, and now we're starting to, you know, on a quarterly basis, we're sharing the results of, okay, here's what we landed. Here's what we built. Here's what we're, here's what we're pursuing and getting everybody involved in, in the whole project or really the whole success of the company right and that's everything from our laborers to our superintendents to project managers to pcs to controller and accounting to everybody we're all in this this big training room that we built and i put it up on the screen and talked through it last year we did you know it was the first one that i'd done and i don't know why i hadn't done it before you know we did kind of a state of the company and said hey here's everything and here are all the challenges from last year Here's what we're continuing to pursue. Look at the success. Look at the profit margins. Look at the customer satisfaction. You know this this idea of of being one of Houston's premier design builders is paying off. Look at the numbers that we're seeing here, people. And when they see the vision and the reward, the vision and the reward, the vision and the reward, it it continues to you know get absorbed into their, into their, you know, thinking process. But, you know, I mean, I had to tell some PMs early on, I'm like, Hey man, I don't, that's not really a job we want to pursue. Um, they're like, wait, what we've worked with this guy before and everything. I'm like, yeah, but go look at the numbers. You know, do we ever make anything working for me? Look how much work it was and, and, and those types of things, right? Like let's not, let's not just be busy to be busy. Let's be busy to be successful. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm curious if there was a a phase or a couple of phases of growth that were the hardest. I've heard people say when you go from this to this, like when you triple in size, things break. Or when they hit this certain point in growth, we really hit a wall. So I'm curious, what was the hardest growth phase? Maybe it was certain going from one revenue level to another, going from one number of employees to the other, maybe it was something else. But what was the the most challenging growth phase, if there was one that stands out? Construction is just challenging, period, right? And so uh, I don't really feel like there was a number that was associated with it. You know, I did look at it and go, the team has to improve. And a lot of the guys that were here with us when we were a 10 to $30 million company we're not the guys that are here when we're, you know, going to be a 200 million and we got 170 million in backlog and those sorts of things. Right. So I did, you know, that was some attrition. That was some decision to let some guys go. That was, you know, COVID kind of gave us an opportunity to, to really keep the A players and kind of, you know, maybe get rid of cast off some of the ones that I didn't see being with us for, for a long time. And I really kept a lot of those individuals through, through COVID and took care of them and made sure that they were, you know, compensated and, and they helped out the company a lot too. Um, and so I, I think just the overall, always trying to, to upgrade your, your pool of talent that you have working here. To me, it wasn't a number, right? It was just, do you have that mindset that you want to go get more and execute and be successful and keep clients happy, right? And and it takes a while to find those guys. And some people still need to be coached on it, uh, especially when we're having a bad day and a customer calls you and you're already tersed about something else. And, you know, you you've probably don't treat it the way that you should. And, and, you know, and then if you do, it's like, hey, man, call the guy back and just apologize and say you're having a bad day or you stubbed your toe and caught you at a bad time, right? And most people are pretty understanding about those types of things. So, I, I mean, I don't have a number, but but all I know is that we we wouldn't be here without the people that are in the organization right now. Yeah. And, and and that's what's so awesome. It's, um, it sounds like as the company grew, it the company outgrew some people that mm-hmm. that you had. What 
the current people, the people who they got outgrown, what was it about them that wasn't keeping up with the company? Like, for example, was it technology? Was it their capacity to lead a team? Was it, uh, what was it about them that made you say, ah, they're just not keeping up and the company has, is, has outgrown them? Really, it was their desire um, and their their buy into what I wanted the company to look like, right? Um, and so, you know, it's a it's a work hard, play hard type of type of environment, right? And you know, you can tell from people when they get burned out or they don't want to do this anymore, or it's too much for them, right? So it's a capacity issue, and you can see they they. They disconnect. They don't contribute. They're they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're finding other ways to occupy their time. And you can see the success in the construction schedules and and the numbers and the, the data will tell you pretty quickly. And so it's sitting down and having those discussions with people and and you know hey you're not getting it done is something going on that I'm not aware of home front health issues something else no you know. I just, you know, I'm having a hard time keeping up. Well, you know, the other three guys in the office down the hall from you aren't having that problem. So why is it you're, you know, what's going on here? And, you know, being considerate and respectful, but sometimes you just got to make those decisions. Yeah. There seems to be two approaches to running a business. One approach is we're going to take the people we have and we're going to fashion a business around them and just do the best we can with what we have. Then the other approach, is we're going to, ha- we have this vision that we want to achieve and we're going to go find the people that help us get there. It seems like your approach is the, the latter. Would you agree with that? That's correct. That's yeah. correct. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Back in our, our first interview about eight years ago, you talked about the importance of burning the ships. Like you're just going to take away plan B and you attributed uh, some of your success to that. How has that burn the ship's mentality played a part in your company's growth, if at all, since then? Well, I mean, I think it has because I, I can always communicate and talk to to the employees that are here. I'm like, hey, man, I, I was a project manager. I was an accountant. I was laborer. I was, I was everything, too. So maybe I'm not in that role anymore. But I know that the battles that you're chasing, and it's it's me to help you be successful. So what tools do you need to be successful? I mean, we didn't have all these things. We didn't have, you know, everybody having iPads and Procore and, you know, and Brick Software and Analytics and all that stuff back then. It was just kind of tee it up and get it done. And at the time, you know, I mean, I had to provide food for my family. So you you, you can't you got to be successful when that's the when that's the only outcome that that you have right failure is not an option when you you know you need to put food on the table at home and having people live in that kind of constant mindset of you know this is how my my success is evaluated and, and judged and and wanting to be part of the part of the overall team right um we don't have to live and die by every project now like we used to so it allows us to be a little more successful and 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 decide on which is the right opportunities to pursue and which ones aren't. Yeah. I'm curious, do you um do you feel like sometimes it's your job to create problems, like big hairy problems for your team to solve and, and sort of burn the ships and take away plan B? I, I don't think I could. <laughs> I'm sure if you ask them, maybe I do a little <laughs> bit, right? Uh, maybe that'd be interesting if you did a podcast with the actual employees and see what they say. But um, this guy's a maniac. I do think He's I used- constantly doing yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think I used to do a lot more of it, right? And what about this? And what about that? And blah, 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 blah. And, you know, in my development is is always wanting to try to develop as a leader and those types of things is is to back up sometimes think about it. You know, sometimes it's like, Hey, before you get really pissed, think about it for 24 hours. And, you know, is it that big, a big of a deal, you know? And, and now I, 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 I don't think that I do that. My, like I said earlier, I want to make sure we're just marching in the right direction. And it's kind of funny. Sometimes I feel like I'm not as involved and, and, you know, especially we have a two-story kind of building and, and I'm upstairs and it's like, Hey, I want to walk around and, t- and talk to the team and what's going on. And, but then I know it disrupts them, right? Because the owner's coming down and, uh, you know, they want to stop what they're doing. So sometimes it's just better for me to give them their space and, and, and trust them to be successful. Yeah. So as the visionary, 
if you're like most visionaries, you have lots of ideas, you have like great ideas all the time. How do you how do you throttle that down so it, it doesn't overwhelm the team? It's like, do you do some things to throttle that, or do they just put their brakes on and filter things out? How how do you how do you manage that double edged sword that that is being the visionary having great great ideas all the time? Well, I've definitely done things. I mean, I've, I've worked with uh, and working with a you know a business coach, right? I've also gone to you know I have a mentor, just a friend of mine that's in the industry, right? Who, who's you know third or fourth generation GC, huge here in, in Houston, great individual, and and I'm like, hey man, can I go to lunch and like here's some of the ideas I have. Like you've lived it, you guys have been fighting it for hundreds of years, right? And he's like, good, bad, don't do that, right? Like, you know, and so I'm like, okay, good, good, yeah. And so, uh, you know, you definitely got to share some stuff with people outside the organization because otherwise, if you just do it within the organization and it doesn't get executed upon, it, they're just like, well, there's one more idea. We're not having the, you know, he's talking and then they'll never follow up on it, right? So in one ear and out the other. So you got to have some resources to talk to individuals outside of the organization to vet some of the some of the things that we come up with within our own brain. And it sounds like you you want to be careful about sharing ideas with people. Is that what you're saying? Like for, for visionaries well, who uh, you don't have that, are you saying, hey, it's better to don't just walk in and throw out ideas in, in a meeting and then be frustrated or because that causes frustration for your team. Is that, are you saying like to take those ideas, go talk to somebody else about them before you share them with your team? That's what I do personally. Okay. And, and, you know, really try to vet those. Is this something we can execute on? Because if you don't, then it's just a dream the owner has, right? Like, and then he's frustrated. Well, they're not living up to my dream and those types of things, right? Like, it's like, okay, here's what I think it takes me to be successful. I talk to other people about it. They back me up or they say, hey, that's, I don't know if I'd do that type of deal, right? And then it's, okay, sit with the leadership team. Hey, here's the way I want to go. What do you guys think? And allow them to give some feedback and buy into it and those types of things, right? And then it's like, okay, let's start rolling it out. Who's going to, who's going to, manage it who's going to make sure it's getting executed upon what's the follow-up and and really talk to everybody through through the organization as those are continued to be continue to be rolled out yeah i love you that can't, you can only have so many of them right otherwise you're just bombarding people with ideas and questions and they're like he's nuts you know <laughs> so yeah yeah I've, I've worked i've worked for one of those guys where it was just big ideas and then you'd never hear about him again. And then he was probably frustrated that nothing happened, but we were so busy just listening to the next crazy idea and then it nothing ever happened. So, yeah, I think that's that's great advice. So, It'll become numb, you know, if nothing ever gets followed up, they just get numb to whatever that person's talking about. Yeah. And then I I saw an interesting case study by the F FMI Corp. They studied why why do successful contractors self-destruct? And one of the common themes after they studied big successful contractors that that went into bankruptcy, they found that too much change was one of them. Constantly changing things, just a constant churn of change. So, yeah, definitely want to avoid that. Um, so, speaking of advice, if you could go back to 2015 and give yourself one piece of advice, knowing what's coming over the the past eight years, what would that piece of advice be? Uh, always know your numbers better um, and, and, and not getting in so worried about having to grow the business, right? Um, and pursuing opportunities that probably weren't a great fit for the talent that we had on the team at the time, right? Be, be okay with the slower growth, um, but continue to be successful over just you know, I want to be this size and we're going to grow this much and, and, and everything else without having the back end that I, that I have now. Great stuff. So you've got an audience of a few thousand construction business owners and future business owners and leaders. Any advice or anything else you want to share with them before we wrap up today? I, all I can say is with anybody in this industry, just 
keep keep grinding, keep keep stay the course. Tomorrow's a new day. Um, you know, hang in there and and I, I always tell people just do what's right. You know, if it if it's not right and your gut doesn't tell you it's right, don't do it. I mean, that's all you can listen to. It's it, it, and go from there, right? Don't get so far out over your skis chasing all these crazy things just because you think it's the hot thing to do. Know what you're good at and stick to that. And and at some point, the success will come. Great advice. Great advice. Well, Tori, it's been fantastic to have you back on here. Maybe we shouldn't wait another eight years. Maybe we should yeah. wait sometime <laughs> sooner. Um, if people want to connect with you, find out more about your company, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, I would go to our website, www.anglerco.com. Tons of information there. All of my contact information is there. Um, we're actually in the process of revamping all of that. That's kind of one of my big goals for this year is redoing all of our marketing and material, our website, to even get talk more about what we're doing on the design build basis. But that's a great starting point. And, uh, you know, I can be reached at, at any time with the numbers that are on the website. Great stuff. Well, congratulations on your success. Thanks for taking the time to share and, and give back. This this kind of insight is it's priceless because very few people um, share this kind of insight, people who, who've actually done it. So I really appreciate it. I've enjoyed it. Thanks for having me back on. And, you know, I may go back and listen to, what was it, episode 15 again or something here in the near future just to, <laughs> to hear what I said. So yeah. I've enjoyed it. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Tori. I appreciate uh, it. Yep. Yeah.